today on Chaotic Bazaar, Alien Robot Mothman Menage a Trois, if you say so. Welcome to Chaotic What is happening, Lee? Good afternoon, Jay. How's it going? It's going. It's going. Hopefully we have all of these uh, tech issues under control. Uh, I think we have a great show today. What do you think? I, I think it's going to be great no matter what happens. It sounds bizarre. Let's see. My story is going to be about some uh, alien UFO cryptid stuff. What about you? And... I'll be discussing Mothman. Is he a harbinger of doom? Does he care about infrastructure? Is he dangerous? Oh, shnikes. And then I think we have a couple other uh, more interesting things to happen after that. Uh, not more interesting than our stories, but just also interesting that I don't want to spoil, I should say. Uh, interesting. Interesting and, and chaotic. So, uh, without further ado, uh, we can get into my story about... Uh, some aliens all right so my story uh i was searching searching the old webs here for uh some alien news some new some new alien news but i came across this associated press story that had no title or the title was null so, if you search Google, you, this story comes up. Uh, and the first thing I noticed about this story was that there was no date and there was no uh, author. Maybe that's normal on Associated Press, but like, it's not normal from news articles that I see. So anyways, this, co this comes from not Moscow. It says the official TASS news agency said today that scientists have confirmed the landing of an alien spaceship carrying giant people with tiny heads. The report was the, the latest strange tale in the official Soviet media, which under the policy of glasnost or openness has recently told of other sightings of unidentified flying objects and alien creatures. So Soviet media, we know that's that's going back to the 80s, at least, right? So scientists have confirmed yeah, that an unidentified flying object recently landed in a park in the Russian city of Vorone. What? How do you, how do we say it? Vorone. 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 I think that's how Vorone. it is. Vorone. Yes. Vorone. Vorone. Like the Voynich manuscript? No, 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 no wrong story. Tess said in the dispatch from the city 300 miles southeast of Moscow, they, also, they have also identified the landing site and found traces of aliens who made a short promenade about the park. Promenade, do -si do So the aliens got out and danced around and had a little parade. Tess said uh, uh, the residents of the village saw a... Saw a large Sorry. shining ball or disc hovering over the park. They reported that the UFO landed and up to three creatures similar to humans emerged, accompanied by a small robot. Like a little uh, R2-D2 guy coming out. A little yeah. R2-D2 deck. The aliens... The aliens were three or four meters tall, so nine to twelve feet tall. Uh, but with very small heads. The news agency quoted witnesses saying they walked near the ball or disc and then disappeared inside. The report was similar to a story last summer in the daily newspaper Socialist Industry, a fantastic newspaper, which told of a purported close encounter between a milkmaid and an alien in central Russia's Perm region. Well, I think we got a story like that later in the uh, later in the episode, a milkmaid and an alien. In the report, uh, Yubov Medvedev was quoted as saying she encountered an alien creature, 
resembling a man, but taller than average with short legs. The creature, she said, had only a small knob instead of a head. It's not the size of the small knobbed head. It's what you do with it, right, buddy? So these small, these small knobbed aliens are... Don't count them out. That's all I'm saying. The test report, which did not give the date of the purported landing in Vornech, said onlookers were overwhelmed with fear that lasted for several days. Jenrik Silinov, head of the Vornesh Geological Laboratory, said, uh, told TASS that scientists investigating the UFO report found a 20-yard depression with four deep dents as well as two pieces of unidentified rock. 20 yards. And that's like 60 feet, isn't it? Isn't a yard close to a meter? So, like, that's, that's pretty big. It's way bigger that's than those people. Big. I guess it's not that big. So at first glance, uh, these unidentified rocks looked like sandstone of a deep red color. However, mineralogical analysis has shown that the substance cannot be found on Earth, Tass quoted Solonov as saying. However, additional tests are needed to reach a more definite conclusion. Solonov said the landing site and path taken by aliens were confirmed using the biolocation method of tracking, but Tess didn't explain what that was. I think you'd use that in Mass Effect. Further confirmation came with witnesses who told who were not told of the experiment and whose accounts match precisely the scientific findings Tess said. The TASS report said residents also reported uh, recent sightings of a banana-shaped object in the sky. In July, TASS disputed a report in Socialist Industry, quoting a UFO specialist, A. Kuzovkin, as saying a 26-foot-wide patch of burned ground near southern Moscow was probably caused by the landing of a UFO. Tess said firefighters believed a haystack, haystack simply caught fire and scorched the ground. Yeah. So there's a little bit of uh, back and forth, knobbed headed, small headed, 10 feet tall, biolocation. Got a few things going on there. But the biolocation thing, according to Wikipedia, was some alleged ESP dowsing method. But I, I didn't have time to look the source up on that. There's some combination of the art of dowsing and ESP. That's the biolocation he was supposed to be talking about, the TAS article. Oh, right. They used rods. They thought they could use rods to, I don't know have them find things like a dowsing, if like they, water, like if anybody ever catches me dowsing, I will scream. I am biolocating biolocating. It sounds so much maybe cooler. in Russian. And there probably is something translated that didn't come across well. So like, do they have biolocating rods for water? Like back in the day when people supposedly did that stuff? Well, I mean, you know, they had, like ESP programs and whatnot too, though. So, no, that's true, and I'm sure we'll do an episode on that one day. We had our own too, so I mean, yeah, exactly. I haven't had my own my own personally yet. This article over at uh, Alcatron uh, states that this event happened December December September 27th, 1989, and with this awesomely. Uh, legible article here we can at least see that scientists confirm landing of shining disc <laughs> sorry they're saying it was an alleged uh, alleged of course alleged I don't believe that I think it was uh, a real sighting and we don't know what it was so it was a UFO so it was alleged uh, sighting uh, in the Soviet Union uh, that date that I just said 
The incident was allegedly allegedly witnessed by a group of children uh, with other members of the local community, including civil servants, uh, claiming to have only seen the craft. So children saw aliens, but other people saw a craft, the craft. Um, the area was populated with uh, yeah, yeah, UFO hunters, of course. Uh, here's the picture of the four kids that um, supposedly... Or four of the kids that supposedly saw this. I'm not sure if we have, we'll have some pictures from them. So the story reported by the Telegraph Agency of Soviet Union, which is TASS, uh, claimed that a group of children had spotted a small ball in the park whilst playing, which quickly morphed into a disc which landed near them. Witnesses then reported a three-eyed alien and a robot exiting the craft. The aliens stared at a horrified onlooker, freezing them in their tracks before departing and returning five minutes later to abduct a 16-year-old boy using what was described as a 50-centimeter-long pistol tube. Pistol tube. Though the children were the only ones claiming to have witnessed the aliens, Lieutenant Sergei Matvevay, Matvevyev, Matt Dayev. <clears throat> yeah, closer. <laughs> of the Vranyech uh, District Police Station claimed to, claimed to have seen the craft, so even the cops saw it. Uh, the Interior Ministry said that they would dispatch troops to the area should the, should the craft appear. So the government is uh, saying, yep, yep, we saw it. So supposedly the test reported that a uh, correspondent spoke to like 10 or 12 youths who claimed to have seen it. Uh, and like I mentioned before, the original quote from the doctor said that they confirmed the, the location of landing using biolocation. Uh, though he, though again, he denied making such a remark or ever carried out such an experiment. Those Lee mentioned, or maybe hasn't mentioned yet, or had mentioned... Uh, about dowsing rods or when we were talking about this before I mentioned dowsing right, rods right. and Russia using that stuff so that may be the, the biolocation that they were doing with I think they're like crooked rods and you hold them in your hand and they direct you to places channeling well and you can something. you can make them a, a few different ways too I'm not super familiar with the technology but i'm gonna yell i'm biolocating whenever anybody catches me doing it right i would assume if you're hunting aliens it has to be made of something special or something or it won't work and channeling the right things uh however it does say this is one thing that i found interesting that these reports were publicized like by the government and promoted as part of the government's new openness and it says it was noted that, unlike in America, the reported beings were completely apolitical and did not even speak during their visit. So uh, we always hear heard about, well, not all the reports in the American reports are people saying that they see UFOs, but a lot of, I think, maybe prior to this time, we're, we're trying to be like anti-nuclear weapons, so they always say... Uh, the humans have to stop using, you know, nuclear technology or whatever like that when the aliens would uh, speak to us allegedly. allegedly. I think that's, and I think that's what they're they're getting here is that they just didn't come. They just like showed up and like made a kid disappear and then reappear. Right, the they're of, just causing trouble in the park. Yeah, they're just like David Blaine. Like no, you know, no difference. You could like watch a David Blaine video and be like, "Yo, this dude's an alien." Or, or imagine taking like Chris Angel into like 1965 or 1980s Russia with magic tricks. I mean, they're going to react differently then. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, there, supposedly there was evidence. Like right here, they found an above-average president presence of uh, radioactive isotope cesium uh, but the vice rector of the university said it basically said it didn't matter I mean that's uh, that's kind of all we have uh, here for the uh, for what's kind of written but I got a video that 
seems to have found a bit more. I spin it analog sounds. As the USSR relaxed its media stranglehold in the late 1980s, it was finally revealed that UFOs were seen behind the Iron Curtain, as well as in the West. One of the first, and easily most bizarre UFO stories to make headlines, was the landing in Voronezh, Russia in 1989. The case contains Voronezh. elements of both traditional UFO sightings, and much older anomalous experiences, and proves that UFO landings aren't just inventions of American pop culture, but part of an enduring global phenomenon. Who thought UFOs were only American? That's such a boomer thing to think. Like, oh, we own the UFOs too. That, that's probably what happened. That's probably the whole the whole thing right there. Do you? Th is it just this guy? What he thinks? I don't know. I'm not gonna hit on this guy. It could guy. be. I know a lot of people that think like I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to even know. On September 27, 1989, three children at South Park in the Russian city of Voronezh noticed a pink Voronezh. light in the sky that turned into a dark red ball as it got closer. It was about five to nine meters wide and moving in their direction. Vasya Surin, Genya Blinov, and Julia Sholakova watched the ball as it approached and hovered in circles about tw what? what? I can do math. <laughs> Two plus two is not three. Right? I'm seeing four right. pictures. You, are you seeing four kids' pictures? I assume I'm seeing four kids' pictures. All right. Maybe, maybe, maybe two of them are named Julia. I can't say that right now. Mm, how about named Mandela Effect? One kid was erased from time and space. Maybe they came back for him later and altered the time space records down at the library or whatever you do. Yeah, it's. I'm pretty Wait. sure it's it has something to do with the Dewey Decimal System. And Julia Sholakova. Something. Watched the ball as it approached and hovered in circles about 12 meters. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> the children could see grass being disturbed under the sphere as it moved. Suddenly, the sphere floated away and returned a few minutes later. Yo, these kids are not wearing 80s clothes. I mean, uh, fair enough, they had hoodies in the 80s, but they did, but yeah, we don't look like that. Those cuts are not 80s cuts of clothes, especially those fucking jeans, man. They were not jeans like that. They would have been like MC Hammer pants, or they would have been like, I don't know, acid washed. Those are definitely not acid washed or stone washed. What do they use back then? They did some silly wash all the time on jeans you could, in the you 80s. Could use, you could use either of those terms interchangeably, if I recall. Oh, okay. They're, they're, no, these are not... 80 styles. By this time, a crowd of about 40 adults. Let's look at these. I mean, that could all be 80s. I don't. I don't dispute that. Everyone in that pictures. I, what's the guy on the on the bottom, the bottom left in the hat? Uh, he's a cop, I think. A bike okay. cop, like chips. Okay. I think. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on there. Later. By this time, a crowd of about 40 adults had gathered and watched as a small hatch opened on the bottom of the sphere. A three-eyed creature peered through the opening. After briefly scanning the terrain, the creature disappeared back inside and the- That's juggernaut, homie. <laughs> what I, I, I've, seen, I've seen the meme. It um, straight up is that. Did the Russians like not think that we had ever heard of Juggernaut before? Well, I still find it unlikely any of them would have gotten their hands on a copy of the X Men in the sixties, unless or the seventies or eighties, unless they were the power elite. Though I mean, by the eighties for sure. Behind That's the iron curtain. 
That's when you'd be getting your 60s and your 70s X-Men comic. And they'd probably get you in a lot of trouble, yeah, too, I would imagine. I mean, like 20 years behind, so they should have just gotten their first copies like five years earlier, right? Well, as as you got closer to Glassnost, I believe that, like, you know, the, the market, the black market shifted quite a bit, and that's one of the reasons Glassnost occurred. If you get a certain amount of culture leak, I think when you have a regime going on, like, you, you just kind of end up in that spot. But that's just theory. I have no clue. The object landed in the park. To the shock of the witnesses, a door opened up on the bottom of the sphere, and the creature- NOT A DOOR! No! Creature, or another similar one, walked out into the park with a bizarre boxy robot. The creature wore silvery overalls, bronze boots, and a large disc on its chest. This guy's like full of metal. It'd be some sort of like exoskeleton. Sure could be. With human hands. It, it had a like wide but small two guy or something. All domed head that rested directly on its shoulders, and two white eyes with a red one in between them. The children guessed the being to be nearly three meters tall. The creature uttered something, and a glowing rectangle appeared on the ground in front of it. He uttered another phrase causing it to disappear. He then adjusted something on the robot, which caused it to start walking away. Terrified, a boy in the crowd began to scream, but was paralyzed. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying, if I saw these robots, I'd be like, aww. Especially this guy, where's he at? He uttered another phrase to, to start walking is. away. If I saw this guy, I'd be like, ah. But then if it was like this, I'd be like, oh, hell no. That's a lot. Of, that's a little bit more terrifying looking. They also have normal heads. Right. <laughs> normal heads, whatever that means. Right. Screen, but was paralyzed when the being turned in his direction. Even that's Light a bit Light shot creepier. from the creature's eyes as it locked its gaze on the boy, causing the crowd to panic. At that instant, the sphere, the robot, and the being simply disappeared. Five minutes later, the visitors reappeared, but this time the being had a meter-long tube in his hand. He pointed it at a 16-year-old boy standing nearby, causing- Fashion checks out. 80s enough for me. Not two 80s, but just like a normal kid that's trying to be kinda hip. Tunnel snakes rule. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do with that uh, 50 centimeter pistol tube that he's got there, but... ...causing him to disappear entirely. The creature then climbed back inside the landed craft. The sphere ascended and flew off into the sky, and the teenager reappeared. A team of Soviet well, scientists it. investigated the original South Park landing finding identical impressions in a diamond shape, and several deep clean holes on the ground. Deep clean The soil holes. beneath an area of flattened grass had turned the consistency of stone. Based on the shape and depth of the depressions, Dr. Yuri Lasovsets estimated the object that landed to be as heavy as 11 tons. The police investigated the incident, and the National Soviet Information Agency, TASS, reported on it, though they usually ignored anomalous reports. Newspapers took interest in the story, and reporters quickly discovered there were thousands of other sightings of red spheres and landings between the 21st and 29th of September. Thou All took place between six... Thousands. That's a lot of sightings. Within That's like that six months, within a six month period. In one area. Six and nine p.m. Most involved only the glowing sphere. 9th of September. I that. All took place between 6 and 9 p.m. Nice. Most involved only the glowing sphere. Some involved the three-eyed alien and robot. Some even involved short, grayish-green creatures in blue, loose-fitting overcoats. Gray wizards. In the U.S., the St. Louis Dispatch picked up the story, and it was soon reported on by the New York Times. Western media generally reported that the object had only been witnessed by children, however, and did not draw much attention to right. earlier sightings. That girl's eyes were a little crazy. The same... Not gonna lie, either. I I don't know when they took this. If this was like, I mean, 
<laughs> well, she saw something that she couldn't explain. Yeah, I don't know if this was taken like at the in- like right after the incident, or if this was like you know a week later they they came up to her and asked her. Attention to earlier sightings. Follow up and look for them on Twitter. The same sources often reported that there were two alien creatures present at the South Park landing, when in reality there was only one. Under its strange veneer, the Voronezh incident contains elements common to some unlikely anomalous experiences. First is the use of a tube-like instrument and its ability to paralyze onlookers. Similar handheld devices are a common element in UFO stories, and they're often used to affect witnesses from a distance. That's a gun, homie. I guess you can classify a tube as anything. That's how they started. It was just basically a tube people were carrying around shooting out of. That's true. Like, that's pre-Blunderbuss. It was even ickier before that. A French farmer named Maurice Maas was paralyzed in 1965 Maurice. after a short being that emerged from a landed saucer pointed a small straight instrument in his direction. George Cate of Nuathra, France, saw a suited humanoid figure standing in front of a domed craft with a metal rod in its hand. Cate and his crew of seven construction workers were all left paralyzed until the being in the craft simply vanished. What's more, Remote paralysis and the use of tube-like devices can be traced back well before the flying saucer landings of the late 20th century. Like modern euphonauts, fairies in the Middle Ages were reported to paralyze their witnesses, <laughs> either by the stroke of their hand or by the use of little wands. Yo, ancient aliens all up in the wand business in the Grimm stories. It's, it's still kind of a concern in, in is it Iceland? <laughs> is it? Pretty sure it is. They still build little houses for the fairies and everything. Yeah, I mean, they do weird shit all around the world for, like, things that don't actually exist. I'm just saying, if if you're going to, like, mess with the Fae where you're not supposed to mess with the Fae, that's probably where you want to go. I'm not saying they should go. Oh, I always thought fairies were good. The Paiute Aboriginals speak of a previous civilization in present-day California, they use small tubes to stun their enemies from a distance. Dude, blowguns now? Okay, yes, we know blowguns exist. They've existed for a long time. The Telfo not a of magic day wand, Mexico though. share stories of the Akals, short black humanoids that sometimes paralyze helpless onlookers. Even shielded Plus from outside 89. media, they don't, the people they don't of Rones saw the same strange <laughs> beings and craft the people around the world have seen for centuries. This reminds us that the UFO phenomenon cannot be explained purely as a product of 20th century American culture, as skeptics often allege. It's that American culture shit again. In one way or another, the witnesses' experiences at Voronezh were real, and they are shared with people from all parts of the world. They are now, buddy. They are now. And so this one, I just there's just some pictures I wanted to go over in this one that Kind of highlights some of the. Uh, oh, here's Russia in case anyone doesn't know where that is. But like right here on the border of Ukraine is where this incident took place. On the border of Ukraine. I wonder if it's the same border then it is as it is today. I think it's moved a little bit throughout the breakup of the everything and the shifting over the last couple decades. But I don't know. For the last sure. couple of weeks. Well, that too. <laughs> Here's uh, one of the pictures. I think the kids drew that. One of the kids drew. Although they did pretty good. They got shadow and everything. Like I would not expect a kid to be doing that good. Here's another one. This is more like it, but then it's been copied a bunch of times. So it has that effect to it. Here's another one that one of the kids did. Although again, those lines are pretty good for one of the kids of just doing it. Yeah, I, don't know. I guess I don't know how they're there. This one, I don't think the kids did. Uh, but there's Juggernaut there. And there's our little robot. And I don't know who... Who this cube guy is. But here's here's kind of my thoughts. Is this is just a guy in a suit. That's all it ever was. And so is this. Just a guy in a suit. And like... 
he had tall boots on like uh, Tom Cruise wears. So it always makes him look like he's taller, you know, like platform shoes kind of deals. But even more so, so you're wearing it's like high heels and it makes like you even taller. But something like that, it's a platform shoes. And then like this whole section's huge and his arms and his head are only like right here. And that's, that's why his arms look so much longer than, than whatever. That's, that's my theory. It's just guys in suits put on by the uh, Soviet government. Uh, they knew they were collapsing. Um, and they were trying to pull the heat off that, and they also wanted to cause confusion with alien shit. That's that's my theory. What about you, Lee? I, I think it's something like that. They are probably just testing the reaction to how people would react to such things, whatever their motivations were, whether they actually think aliens are real or they're just messing with their populace, because they did that a lot. For sure they did. For sure we, all the governments do. Right, right. I'm not saying they're not still doing it. They're allegedly either case. Yeah, this is a cool picture. Love this picture. Love this picture. I love their silly made up letters. That's hilarious. So cute. Aw. Look, you see the, the shadow of the big uh, three eyed alien. This looks so cute there. I like this little alien guy. I want to know more about his backstory. I don't really care too much about the aliens who seem like they're in control or the robots, the, the three-eyed things. I'm more worried about uh, this guy's backstory. Who's he and what's he do in the universe? Is it a he or she? Is it even a... For, for all we know. For all we know, they just have a part-time job and do this on the weekends. And the other guys own the ship. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe this guy owns the ship and he took the other ones on like a, a crew, like a tourist sort of thing, and he's showing them around. It's showing them around. Right, right. Scare, scare the earthlings sort of things. Get a nice dry D 3D recording of it. Yeah, exactly. Then, you know, take it back back home to your plant. Everybody laughs. Yeah, it'll be like, it's like, all right, all right, shh, shh, it's coming up, it's coming up. Oh, is this where you pull out the ride? Yeah, shh, shh, shh it's coming up, it's coming up. And they're all watching and pull out the... 50 centimeter pistol tube the humans quaking well, I mean, in fear you, all the aliens it, just laughing and laughing it doesn't even do anything <laughs> it's just a damn tube if you showed up in the 1800s with like a modern tactical flashlight though that's what they're gonna think is happening it's got a light tube and like you'll blind the people because they're not used to electrical light i don't know i'm just saying yeah you would definitely be burnt at the stake very quickly with that well anyways that's oh, that's in any decade <laughs> anyways that is uh my uh alien story all right so what do you got for us today lee today we're going to talk about one of the cryptids i find most interesting and that's the Mothman of Point Plains. Um, is he a harbinger of doom? Does he care about infrastructure? Is he dangerous? Is he involved in national politics? Today we're going to discuss all of it. Oh, shit. Now, we have an article from Insider from 2019 with some nice pictures as well. Yeah, apparently uh, Trump tweeted about it, huh? Well, I mean, I would assume that they have some sort of dossier they give the presidents about Mothman and such. <laughs> the Mothman dossier. I, I think that's probably what's in that, that, that briefcase they like to carry around. Mothman material. All right, so what does the article say? Uh, well, on a Saturday, this is from 2019. This is a little dated, but... A Saturday tweet posted by Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia wishing Mason County residents a happy Mothman Festival, which this year is on the 18th and 19th, I believe, of September. Uh, caught the eye of President Donald Trump, possibly because the tweet included a photo of the senator standing in front of the creepy metallic 12-foot-tall statue of the Moth-Human Hybrid. Whether he is aware of the Mothman legend or not, Trump, quote, tweeted Manchin on Sunday and wrote, 
I go along with Joe <laughs> that may have been more of a nod to Manchin, a Democrat continuing to support coal production in mining jobs for his Appalachian constituency. But even if Trump wasn't endorsing the Mothman Festival specifically, the presidential nod toward a creature that terrorized the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in the 60s and brings upward of 2,000 tourists a year to its annual, annual festival begs the question, what is the Mothman and why do people celebrate him? I think that Joe, that Joe remark's pretty funny. That shit is hilarious. <laughs> is that the, that's the Joe he can get behind, I guess. I don't. It, it begs the question that if the current president got more behind Mothman, I, I, I think we should just tag both of them. Yeah, I mean, it also just kind of shows you what side Joe Manchin's on politically anyway. Right, no, he's gonna he's he's gonna he's gonna get that. I think he is sort. I think he's mocking Mothman. That's what I think he's doing. So you think he's trying to like get Mothman to destroy more infrastructure? I know, well, I think he's mocking Mothman and I, showing him how they're not they haven't been fixing infrastructure and he doesn't give a shit. And, and, and allegedly, I'm not saying Mothman has destroyed any infrastructure. He's trying to provoke Mothman. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to provoke well, him out. Mothman cares about infrastructure. <laughs> That's the button you'd push with Mothman. I can't tell that from this guy, from this picture right here, but I I believe it from the stories. So the the legend of the Mothman began on November 12th, 1966. It's said to have begun when a group of five men preparing for a burial in a graveyard near Clendendon, West Virginia, saw something that looked like a brown human being take off from a nearby tree and fly over their heads. Three days later, two young married couples were driving past an abandoned TNT plant near Point Pleasant, described seeing six or seven fa tall foot creature with wings folded against its back, according to American Hauntings. They sped away once they sighted it, but the creature disappeared on a nearby hillside, then started flying behind the car, which the couple said was driving over 100 miles per hour. The whoa. same night... Oh, go ahead. No, just whoa. I'm just... That's interesting. That same night, Another group of four people, along with the two couples, reported seeing a similar creature to the police. Each group spotted the same creature in at least two spots near Point Pleasant, but the creature disappeared upon reaching the city limits. In a town about 90 miles from Point Pleasant, another man reported an equally strange occurrence that night. His dog started barking at the barn behind his house, and when he went outside with a flashlight to check and spotted two red eyes the size of bicycle reflectors. The man ran back inside to get his gun, but was too afraid to go back out, and his dog disappeared. Although one of the men who spotted the creature outside the TNT plant said he also spotted a dead dog lying on the side of the road. Wow. On November, on November 16th, a press conference was held in Point Pleasant to discuss the sightings, and the reporters dubbed the creature the Mothman after a Batman TV character. Interesting. His name... And they am off of Batman. And I want to I want to say it's like Adam West Batman <laughs> inspired the name Mothman because I think that's the era of Batman we're talking about, or is it even before that? <laughs> no, that'd, be, the that'd be Adam West, wouldn't it? Yeah, wasn't he the first TV Batman? Like the only one I, for a long time. The one with the yellow belt, it's really loud, and Adam West in it. Right, right, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think there's a Batman before that. So. Not that I'm aware. In, in in the months that followed, the legend, as legend has it, the Mothman continued to terrorize residents. One family that lived near the abandoned TNT plant reported seeing a red light in the sky above the plant that they could not identify. After seeing the red light, the mother of the family drove to a neighbor's house. As she got out of her car, a figure who had been lying on the ground next to it stood up. She described it as a gray creature that was bigger than a man with glowing eyes. The woman ran into her neighbor's house and the creature followed her onto the porch and peered in through the window. The police were called, but it vanished before they arrived. The woman said that months later, she would hear what sounded like a woman keening outside her home and she believed it was the Mothman. Keening? Keening. It's like a, a, a wailing. Oh, uh, okay. 
The Mothman sightings, along with alleged UFO sightings and run-ins with strange men dressed in black in the area, led to a swarm of monster hunters descending on the area. One famous paranormal writer, John Keel, visited Point Pleasant, bringing more widespread attention to the phenomenon along with him. Hmm. Is this guy now, street all that, when it all came that to kind monsters? of culminated in December 15th, 1967. A 700-foot bridge linking Point Pleasant to Ohio collapsed during rush hour, killing 46 people. On the same night, families who lived near the TNT factory reported seeing strange lights above the facility. Keel wrote that the window of supernatural activity had been opened in the area, leading to above-average paranormal sightings and tragic events. That sounds like something Keel would say. I didn't know they fucked with portals. Well, I mean... Keel is, Keel is very opportunistic in a lot of people's opinions. At the time the Mothman sightings occurred, the Mason County Sheriff said he believed the sightings were due to an unusually large heron bird living in the area. Um, and that's another big. thing that, that people think it's a big owl, think that it's some sort of heron. And they are big birds with shiny eyes. Six foot tall owl? Not so sure about, but a heron? Yeah, they're pretty seven, terrifying. Seven to twelve foot tall. <laughs> you know, like laying prone on the road and standing up to seven or eight foot tall. That's weird. Yeah, let's just say those are exaggerated and go to six. That's still a gigantic owl, right? A six foot tall owl. But a heron, Big enough I to can hurt see you that. probably. I mean a small one can hurt you. Six foot tall owl will be able to pick you up and carry you away. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> not, not in, not in this atmosphere. The six foot tall owl? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we could test it. <laughs> the first, we have to find a six foot tall owl, which you know, there, there's owl, there's there's, tech, there's technology. You could do it. You can splice that GN, DNA. Nothing now. I mean, you have to spend the twenty thousand dollars for the technology or whatever, but it doesn't matter anymore. I want. I don't want. I don't like to think about that part of things. It's only twenty thousand dollars dollars to make an owl man. Well, I think like all the biological parts are going to be uh, really expensive, comparably. But is there a it used to be the hardest junkyard? part was the whatever the Chinese developed that that splicing program. What's it called? CRISPR. CRISPR. You can do a lot of weird stuff with CRISPR, man. You well, still need the infrastructure to be able to implement it genetically, but you could do stuff with CRISPR. I don't, I don't think you should try and give your family gills or anything, but I, I, I think if you're going to if you're going right to do that, down. find a different method. Just think if you don't have to worry about buying like or renting land, like you can just go into the water if you have gills and be like, "Fuck it, I own all this now." Well, <laughs> Well, I mean, I, do, I assume after the you? golden age of technology and Warhammer 40K, that stuff was happening all the time. Like, you know, you get to a heavy G planet, and suddenly everybody's really short and stocky and has beards or whatever. I mean, that's that's Warhammer. Space dwarves. Yeah. The, I mean, they're not canon, but they are. They're they're called, what are they called? Um, but they are space dwarves in Warhammer 40K. There's, nobody likes to talk about them. Yeah, right. There were in first edition anyway, or yeah, first right. edition. Well, Maybe well, they second? get some. You know how the the lore in that series is. They still get some modern lip service, even somewhat recently. So, like you know, it's still story stuff. <laughs> I don't recommend you show up fielding an army of them. I mean, I actually I do. Show up to your local games workshop place, and you know, insist you get to play that way. <laughs> Space dwarves, especially if they're the original models that were one time sanctioned by. Games Workshop. Right, get everybody's signature from those eras too and then complain about like maybe complain about planned obsolescence in their board game to keep you having to buy have, hundreds of dollars worth of models just to keep an army up and legal. And get and get the artist to call the store that made the original miniatures and guilt them as well. Right. Like, you know how much time I put into these dwarves that you're now ignoring? I'm sure Mothman would do it. I'd, I'd field a Warhammer 40k Mothman army, no problem. 
I recommend you do that at your local Games Workshop place too. Like my Mothman Astarte. <laughs> my Mothman Astarte Mecca. Keel, who was involved in a lot of paranormal activity and findings and writing a lot of para paranormal coverage and or influenced fiction at the time, um, he ended up writing the Mothman prophecies. Mm. And he, he kind of alleged that the Point Pleasant residents experienced precognitive thoughts related to the collapse of the bridge before it happened. And this is something I've seen in other stories about the Mothman or things that are similar is there's often that sense of doom that the locals come forward after the bad things happen to tell everybody that they were too scared to come forward. And this has happened like in a couple different towns where he's been sighted. And it's just really odd. Hmm. But but they went ahead and made that into a, a movie, which, you know, of course, in 2002, there was the movie, The Mothman Prophecies. And... They made $23 million at, at the box office and helped kind of jump start interest nationally. And that's when they started working on more of the tourism aspect of things. Hmm. I've never so seen every the movie. Year, go ahead. So I've never seen the movie. I have, but it's been a very long time since I've seen it. I'm pretty sure I made fun of Richard the whole time. <laughs> Including the pivotal shot at the end, which oh, I'm not going to spoiler it. it like but when I read the when I read the synopsis, it's like, oh yeah, I remember making fun of that. It looks like it made fifty five point one million at a bu budget of thirty two million. So right, right. So that's pretty decent considering how much money they spent on it, and it's, I guess, about Mothman, who <laughs> wasn't a big star at that point. Now he is. So um, Richard Greer um, catapulted him to stardom. I I, I kind of I think the Associated Press probably did a better job of that than anybody. Has and anyone Keel probably did a better job of that than anybody? Has anyone ever seen Richard Greer and the Mothman at the same time in the same place? Not that I know of. I mean, well, I'm we could always just start asking these people specific questions on Twitter. Yeah, I'm going to bet that Art. Richard Greer is the Mothman. That's what I'm just going to go ahead and... Um, so I've never seen them together uh, at the same time. Does he go to the festival? I'm sure people at the festival don't actually see Mothman at the festival. Well, I mean, but people, I'm sure there are people dressed as Mothman. He's had to have been at the to festival, the festival so, once. So he, he, would, he would be able to get away with it at the festival. <laughs> Whether he's Richard Gere or not. It's like, finally, the one time I can go out in public and people people won't know. This makes me think I'm supposed to accuse every Mothman at the festival if I go this year of being Richard Gere. That's also uh, possible. Hey, here's that picture of Joe Manchin and the Mothman. Not sure which one of these characters is scarier. I know which one has more done more damage to society, though. <laughs> oh... Fuck Joe Manchin. Nobody should. <laughs> well, if he was in prison, then that'd be fine. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. It's a complex issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I owned coal mines, uh, I would totally understand it was a complex issue too. Like, we can't just go shut down all my money. We can't do yeah, I would that. Just, How am I going to keep making millions of dollars? I just, I just repurposed my coal mines. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like uh, if I was we... if I ran as any political uh, party and then was like, come on, I can't do what my political party does. I have to do what the other political party does. Like, it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, it's that doesn't, just doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter which party you're in. I, I think it makes sense on the lens you already said, and it's the fact that he's very attached to certain industries. And certain yachts and... Right, right, that too. I mean, he's not making anybody move their historic bridge or anything like that dragon guy, but... The 
Bezos is making someone move a historic bridge so his yacht can get through. It's in the paper this week. Oh my god! And like I'm just like angry over it because I don't, you know, it's just like just take all the money they made during the pandemic and distribute it right now. And if they get mad, you put them in an efficiency apartment, take the rest of their stuff. That's kind of where I'm at. But I'm just kind of angry over the whole thing. I mean, it'd be he more is a dragon. useful than going to space for like I mean, five seconds. Space, Not even space, space, but whatever. Space, space libertarian is a whole separate issue. I don't think Mothman has political allegiances. Though, I mean, think about this. If infrastructure is a problem on Earth, what sort of monsters are going to show up in space? In the future when like you know in the 2040s like you know we need new like domes or whatever and everybody's like we don't need new domes and then mothman shows up i guess i don't know yeah it looks like they started the festival right after that movie came out a year later they made that awesome statue and then uh in 2005 they right. made the museum right and harrison also like had mothman themed food and stuff for the first festival as well like there's a diner there's a local diner um yeah the statue got created yeah i think we have a video of it too don't we i think we do uh in southern Ohio and northern West Virginia, the legend of Mothman is as strong as it was 45 years ago. It's become part of the personality of Point Pleasant. Where in December of 1967, the Silver Bridge collapsed, killing 46 people. Two of the dead were never found. But the stories of the creature that came to be known as Mothman began many months earlier. And this is where all of your Mothman sightings started back in 66, November 66. Jeff Wamsley gives tours showing people where the legendary seven foot tall winged man with glowing red eyes the size of baseballs was spotted at least 100 times between November 1966 through December of 1967. He also runs a Mothman museum. The first witnesses were two couples together at a town gathering spot, the power plant, which sounds like a lover's lane of the late 1960s. As they got up closer, she said, what is this guy doing standing in the road? And she said, when the headlights hit it, it turned and looked at him. And she said, the wings were looked like angel's wings above its head, way above its head. And she said, that's when the wings came out. And they said, that's not a man. They say Mothman chased their car at incredible speeds. The women were said to be hospitalized for shock. The witnesses all described the same thing, a faceless, red-eyed freak who seemed to have a message to tell. But what was this message? Eyes without a face. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> So I wanted to make make a note that Mothman had angelic wings. Wings of an angel. See? Savior of humanity. Not a bad guy. A good guy. Carolyn well, Marcella I mean, if he, runs the... If he's that worried about infrastructure, he should run for local politics. That's true. Maybe he has... Uh, uh, more in common with Batman than I first thought. Local diner. Her sister saw Mothman, but won't do interviews. In fact, most people won't do interviews. And it flew over top of her, and she looked up, and she said, when I seen them big red eyes, she said, uh, we were out of there. Can't tell you what the rest of it looks like. A lot of respectable business people, uh, you know, uh, young kids, older people, elderly. Those wings are not angelic. Those are very insectoid wings. I mean, metal, but they're veiny. Look how veiny those wings are. Maybe angels have veiny wings. I think they should all be painted that way. I mean, they look cool, but they're not angelic. Not in my opinion. Uh, but the people that I've talked to, you know, they just said, you know, we're afraid that people would laugh at us and, you know, think that we were crazy. But, you know, they said we know what we saw. And, and uh, you know, some of them said that it was a, a large bird of some sort. Others said it wasn't a bird. 
How can any of this be explained? Critics say these sightings are really misidentified planes. Owls are just plain pranks. This is an area of chemical plants and military ammunition storage. It's an industry town on the Ohio River that didn't have the kind of environmental regulations it has today. Somebody was up. See, that is rife for extraterrestrial visitation. Oh, for sure. You know, people are going to see more stuff if they've got chemicals running through their systems and <laughs> their genomes changing because of local business. <laughs> I'm just saying. Stuck there fishing one day, saw this uh, fluorescent green stuff coming out of the water, sort of like Jed Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. Could it have been some type of mutated bird of 50s and 60s sci-fi fear? Or was Mothman really here to warn the river people? Those I mean, it almost sounds like the Toxic Avenger might have been coming out. The, it was the river people like classical music. <laughs> Loud classical music. Loud classical music. That's how you keep him at bay, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, I thought the announcer was going to start shouting in a second. <laughs> Those sightings came to a terrifying like that. Yeah, climax that <laughs> when that bridge collapsed, killing 46 people and changing the area forever. The collapse was so extreme, it set federal regulations on bridge construction. And those Mothman sightings, they stopped too. That looks like a, that looked like a sports team eagle. It didn't look like a, a Mothman. <laughs> Every time they show that picture, I'm like, okay, that looks like a sports team. Oh, maybe it's a little dark here. Yeah, that looks like a sports team to me. Mothman sightings, they stopped too. You believe it? I believe they saw something, yeah. I, I don't doubt their stories one bit. I mean, what it was, I can't tell you, you know, personally what it was. I know that they saw something that was, that was out of the ordinary. Something those witnesses and the people of Point Pleasant will never forget. I hope not. It makes them two million dollars a year when there's not a pandemic. I mean, I wouldn't forget a Mothman if I ever saw a Mothman. Yeah, fair enough. But if I saw a Mothman with angelic wings, I might be taken aback a little bit differently. I'm prepared for anything in 2022. Like a Care Bear could show up with angelic wings, and I'm gonna be like, okay, why is there a Care Bear here? But you know. It is what it is, man. So here's a video. I do think you, you should run for office. Here's a video that apparently captured Mothman on video. So let's see what this... It's a no-budget production. Oh, it might be unsuitable for minors. Shit. I just got done building these birdhouses. Hopefully I can get a couple of woodpeckers to move in. And help me take care of this bug problem I've been having. I think I think what this the? is staged. Holy shit! Holy shit! It's it, a it's, mother effing moth, wings. man. Are you? Look, the wings are angelic, very angelic. This is a very angelic moth, man. It reminds me of one of those fairy moths or whatever they are, uh, rose no, something we're... something moths. Right there, the yeah, the cute ones. Are you kidding me? Right. This fluttering weirdo broke my friggin' window! And now he's eating my sweater! Well, no wonder why I have holes in my clothes! Cause this bastard's got a taste for pantyhose! I mean, wow! Look at that pile of lid shit he left on my shingles! Wait, actually, that's not my sweater. I've never seen it before. Hey! Drop that cashmere! And get the hell out of here! Yeah! Oh my god! He's yeah. throwing mothballs at me! <laughs> Yikes! He's you. Alright, this is not the Mothman that I know. The Mothman that I know is a dear, sincere character who is right, for he's the good concerned of humanity. About, uh, he's concerned about infrastructure. Right, this right, This Mothman's right. plainly not. Yeah, this is Mothman smears to muddy the waters of the Mothman. This is just <laughs> counter, some dis, dis counter Mothman propaganda. Exactly, it's a, a government disinfo campaign on the Mothman. Using his nutsack to attack. I might want to move back. Jeepers creepers! Beware of these crotch grabbing creatures. They'll try to nail you with their genitalia. Screw oh, that's this! Good I better not make him mad! The last thing I need is to get killed by a flying go-dad! 
freaking Mothman! Unbelievable! And cut. I wonder and if he, cut. he does stuff like this a lot, like in his how his neighbors feel about it. Was that from like 2006? Was that from like the very first days of YouTube? It, you know, it, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. Well, there's at least an eight-year-old comment there, so maybe. I mean, some of the biggest powerhouses in the industry are, were making content like that 10 years ago. And DMCA'd, and our, ch our channel's been canceled now. We'll flirt with it a little bit. Mothman, there's no need to feel down. I said, Mothman, lift that man off the ground. I said, Mothman, because you're in a new town and there's kids to be abducted. Mothman. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Smearing the Mothman again. The more, Everyone more it's all Mothman propaganda, anti-Mothman propaganda. The government, I swear, has gotten to everybody. Like, it's already in the base fabrics that Mothman is a bad guy, and I think we need to change that. I think Mothman should be seen as a good guy. I think there's a reasonable reason to go door to door. Like, organize, like, a national Mothman campaign. Like, only just to make people feel better about Mothman. Uh, He'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'm not going to walk anywhere, but, like, if we can well, share no, we this video. So, if we share this video, and we have everyone that watches this, sees it, shares it, and we can get the good word out about Mothman, how he's actually just a superhero who's here to defend uh, infrastructure and, and look out for humanity. I think he's like infrastructure quality assurance on some like upper level of something, something. I agree. I agree. Maybe his hobbies like metal stress or something. <laughs> he, he flies around. He's got a better view than, you know, like we just invented drones. What, like a few years ago where you can look at stuff like that easy now. So it was just him before that. And he's a mothman. Everybody reacts badly when they see him. True. I'm not saying if someone reacts badly, you should fly through the air in your angelic rings at hundreds of miles an hour after them. Uh, well, I mean, you, you do you. Yeah, I mean, if you can do that, go ahead. I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do with your f ability to fly. Fuck it. All right, yeah, anything else that you want to uh, say about Mr. Mothman here, Lee? Um, you know, there's other, other sightings in other cities, and there's a lot of argument whether he's even going to come back at all. But I'm going to go at least go to the festival this year if I can work it into pandemic ridiculousness. I bet they and I'll don't keep care. us apprised of things. Nice. I get some live reporting. Well, cool. Uh, right now, I think we have a PSA uh, coming up. So we'll be right back. Hey man, and I got some kush that you just gotta try. Yeah, but it'd be chronic. The dankest marijuana. Oh, well, I don't know, it looks like shit. Turn me into a chicken. Oh damn, what should they do? Bust out a lighter. Fuck yeah. Get a pizza. Get like four of them. Get it in the air. Yeah, let's see if this kid's that smart. I'm not smoking your ditch weed. <laughs> what the fuck's he doing? That's free weed. Oh, me a weed snob. And we're back. I think we have one last segment for today's show. And it's a very titillating one. Today we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to look at a entry into the world of alien erotica and specifically alien BBW erotica. But that's just because I had to type that in to find this story. And the one that we're going to look at today is called Surrendered. And the, the tags to it are Alien Warrior, BBW, Science Fiction, BDSM, Romance, Brides of the Kindred, Book 20. And so I just want to point out that 
this book is actually a pretty good deal, I would think, because it's 14 hours and 20 minutes. It's an audio book. It costs twenty five dollars, but yeah, you could listen to this from the moment you woke up till going to bed. Like, spend one entire day doing this and pretty much nothing else, or upset people at work by listening to it two days in a row. That's true. Just put it on, keep it on repeat. Um, so we're gonna take a listen to what alien erotica uh, may sound like. And let, actually, let's uh, let's, we can pull up the. I don't know if we can see it all on the screen, but I can read it. It says, uh, Commander Thornex is a hybrid, half kindred and half pyro, a much feared people who have the ability to unleash horrific maelstorms of flame whenever they are angered. All his life, Thorn has struggled to control the destructive power within him. A horrible accident in the past made him swear to never unleash the fire again and for many years he has kept it to himself under tight control during his many undercover missions as a spy for the kindred his iron will has never wavered and that is until he allows himself to be sold as a slave on Yanni 6 now none of that screams uh, BBW, BDSM, or romance to me. Well, I mean, it's got a Torian aspect to it, though. Like T O R, not T A U R A N I A N. Um, I don't know. His name's Thorn. <laughs> that is awesome. The, the protagonist's name is Thorn. It's his sister's name, Rose. <laughs> I don't it's fine <laughs> so this book is by Evangeline Anderson and it's narrated by William Martin arranging to have himself sold as a body slave to one of the sacred seven the mistresses of Yoni six who held the keys to the library of all knowledge was an important mission possibly the most important of his entire life for within the library was information about the Hive, a race of insectile alien beings that were known to be ravenous and tireless in their conquest of other races. And now the Hive had set their sights on Earth, the small blue and green planet the kindred were currently protecting. Of course, it would have been much easier if the kindred could simply have asked for the information. Unfortunately, the mistresses of Yoni Six considered males inferior and refused to deal with them, so there had been no choice. Someone had to go undercover as a slave, and, knowing the gravity of the situation, Thorn had volunteered. If he failed in his mission and was unable to gain access to that knowledge, the kindred, as well as the entire human race, would be doomed. Oh, shit. That's a mission right there. It sounds like one. Still, the only thing that I've heard that was on the erotic side so far, which creeps me out, not to shame anyone, was the ravenous insect uh, creatures. And whenever I hear ravenous, I don't think of that in like, uh, I usually think of that in a more spicy uh, way when I hear right, it. no, it, it's it's traditionally more often used in a spicy context. Yeah, like not not like a spicy kitten context, but like a spicy kitten. Context. Right, right. So it didn't matter what ridiculous outfit he had to wear or what he had to do. He, I, I am also picking up a bit on like, uh, what is that? Kind of like submissive male stuff, like where he like he he has to like volunteer to be a slave to these women. I think they're women. I think that's what they're talking about. Like, cause the women rule on Yanni. I think that's what they said. Are are they vampire women? I'm still not sure why they're calling them kindred. Uh, yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I mean, we're probably gonna have to get the book it... to find that out. Uh, you know what I think? I, I think I'm gonna. 
I mean, it's free with the 30 day trial to Audible. Fair enough. I mean, that's I'm a thirty dollars. That's a thirty dollars <laughs> savings from Audible, or twenty five dollars savings from Audible. That's pretty crazy if you get your free trial and listen to this book. It might take you thirty right, days right. to listen to this book. But here's my here's my other problem. Before we keep going, this is book number twenty. Do you think you can get through books one through nineteen on Audible before you get to book twenty? I mean, that's you might as well take a, a month off. How much is how much is Audible a month? <laughs> I don't know, but that's a deal. No matter how you look at it, if you can read all, or listen to all twenty of these books, how much money is that? That's a lot of money. That's without even me doing well, math. Right. That's well, like and there are a lot of other five hundred dollars, not just from her on Audible as part of that membership. I'm looking. I'm curious. Well, this isn't tag, an ad for hilarious. Audible, but Audible. This could be an ad for Audible. It, it kind of the difference is. is you paying us or not must be bought by it's, Mistress Nasana, one of the sacred it's seven who were protectors and curators of the library, and once in her service, he must do whatever it took to gain her trust until he could get access to the knowledge of the hive. Only then could the kindred know definitively how to defeat the hungry horde of insectile aliens coming after them. All right, I want, I'm kind of interested in this book, even though I don't understand when the, when the, uh, the hottie toddy stuff is coming in, but like, I have no clue. I, I'm getting aliens. I'm getting warrior, although it doesn't really seem like warrior. It seems more like spy or something like that. Like, right. He's undercover in some way. <laughs> yeah. That's like, I think of warrior. I think of like, more on the barbarian side or going into battle and like leading fights not like subterfuge like that's generally not when I think of a warrior uh, and then so I get the science fiction I do I'm just not sure when the BBW BDSM and romance come in she's written a lot of books Let's see. Let's see if you can get all of them on here. Claimed is the first book. That one's Claimed. 12 hours long. Holy shit. Stolen, which is the 25th book, is 18 hours long. I'm telling you, you could spend an entire month. It's looking like if you subscribe to Audible with your free trial, free 30-day trial... I don't know, like, just call Audible and tell them that, that we sent you there, and then maybe that'll get them to sponsor us. But you could literally watch all month long, listen all month long to Brides of the Kindred. And you can go directly to her website as well. There's book two right there. Hunted. She's well, let's go see what the first book different is about. stuff. <laughs> Claimed. Oh, well, there's there's not much to say. Let's see if I click on it. No, the kin is this Kindred Tales or Kindred Birthright? <laughs> Brides of the Kindred. That's what we're looking at. Okay. Let's listen to the first episode. <laughs> first Prologue. book. Dusk was falling on Idlewild Avenue. Rows of identical townhouses, lit softly from within, lined the street, which was overshadowed by huge old oak trees. A light evening shower had just passed, and now the atmosphere was heavy with moisture. Tendrils of steam rose from oh, the shit. asphalt. Oh, shit. Hold the sweet on. We got moisture and tendrils. We're already, <laughs> we're already well on our way to our erotica, and we're only like a minute scent in. scent of honeysuckle filled the air. In number 11, at the end of the row, a slender female figure moved in front of a large picture window, one of the selling points of the otherwise unremarkable houses. She was walking back and forth, placing objects on a table, or perhaps taking them away, maybe cleaning up after dinner. She moved with ease and grace as she did the mundane chore, completely unaware. Do we not know? I thought we were looking at this chick. How do we not know what she's doing? said the mundane chore 
Yeah, like if it's so mundane, we should know. Is she setting the table or cleaning the table? Like, come on, this is just lazy, right? Like, you just literally, the, the writer couldn't decide what they wanted them to do. Ah, just some mundane bullshit. Who cares? Let's keep keep on to the... Where that she was... Keep on to the lady. That's what they're being she's saying. Watched. Across the road from the lighted Ooh, window and the slender figure, two pairs of eyes looked on avidly as she moved. One set of eyes was a pale, piercing blue that was almost white and the other set was a warm amber gold that wouldn't have looked out of place in the face of a tiger. Neither pair of eyes was human. Mine. The low rumbling growl came from the owner of the amber eyes. He was tall, six foot seven at least, with shoulders so broad he would have to turn sideways to go through most doorways, but he moved silently, with a feral grace that belied his muscular physique. Dark stubble covered his cheeks and I mean six foot seven people aren't that wide like how wide is that to get through a door? What's a doorway? Let's say 30 inches is it like almost three feet wide is a standard door Right, but but as an archetype he's supposed to be that big and strong <laughs> That's like really a wide a, mo a mountain of a man that moved like a ninja thorn sidled through the door and to have to turn sideways, I mean, couldn't even go in, like, a little, like, just totally, like, sideways and, like, shimmying in? It's like, it's like two Danzigs. <laughs> Double Danzig? Trying to get through a door. Double Danzig door dance? That's but they got but taller, on. but taller. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> right, she said, like, seven foot something, not, like, three right, feet right. tall. Right, right, as opposed to I could, like, use a chair and jump over the two Danzig stuck in the door. <laughs> I'm not Chin saying I'm trying to set that up for a 3D photography head. session, but... <laughs> not yet, Baird. It'd be a, it'd be a good experience, right? The one beside him cautioned. He was as tall as his friend, and just as muscular, but he had short, spiky blonde hair that complemented his pale blue eyes. Can't wait much longer. Long, strong fingers curled into a fist, as though the amber-eyed male could grasp the slender figure in his hand and hold her through sheer force of will. Been dreaming about her every night, Sylvan. I ache for her. What does she look like? There was genuine curiosity in the question. Though Baird had never seen her outside his dreams, Sylvan had no doubt he could describe his chosen female to the last detail. Barrett and Sylvan. I've, I've heard of one of her books. <laughs> so one of those is a Final Fantasy name, and one of those is an elf. Right, no, I mean, like, Cloud Strife popped into my head when she said that. <laughs> like, literally happened. And you know she and the other time that's happened this this week, I was Titus actually, so it was probably Titus. Yeah. So she's a nerd. Fucking beautiful, it hurts to look at her. Yellow hair like that's that in her bio. Longer, more golden, and her eyes. Baird shook his head, like jewels, a pale gray that's almost silver. You find these human women appealing then? Only her. She's the only one I can see. The amber eyes stared hungrily across the road. I need her soon. Need to be with her. In her. You're sure she's the one? Sylvan stared doubtfully at the woman silhouetted in the window. She was humming softly to herself, but despite the distance and the pane of glass between them, he could hear her perfectly, and knew Baird could too. As attuned as his half-brother was to this human female, he could probably hear her heartbeat even from across the street. I know she's the one. There wasn't a shred of doubt in the deep, rumbling voice. Didn't I tell you we've been dream-sharing? And her scent. He inhaled deeply, and his dark gold eyes were suddenly half-lidded with desire. It's her, all right, and she's ripe for bonding. I want her. I know you do. <laughs> Ripe for bonding. That's a nice I've, way to put I've, it. I've never heard that used that way before, or in conjunction at all. That's like the least erotic way to put it, I feel. Like, I feel like that's something you wouldn't want it to, to say in a team building meeting in a normal job. <laughs> 
I got us all together in this little room so we can be ripe for bonding <laughs> is not going to Which play one of you well is ripe for bondage? <laughs> but Baird. The other male shifted from foot to foot uneasily. You haven't been back that long. Only three days, and it's a miracle you escaped alive. Don't you think it might be a good idea to wait a while? To take some time to recover? Wait, what? Waited long enough, was the rumbling reply. Six months in that hell hole, and the only thing keeping me alive and sane were the dreams I had of her. I won't wait any longer. She's mine, whether she knows it yet or not. You'll scare her. His half-brother objected. Human women are frightened enough of us as it is. I won't hurt her. Just need to take her. Bond her. <laughs> Unconsciously, he took a step toward the lighted window, but his half-brother put a restraining hand on his broad shoulder. Wait. The other male's voice was soothing. <laughs> Just wait until they serve the papers. One more night and she's yours. But you can't have her now. Not without violating the contract. Oh my god, so many things to unpack here. What is the contract? How is he only alive for a few days? What is going on? Well, this would be part of the BDSM angle. A lot of people that are into BDSM do do contracts. They do do contracts? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, not do do contracts, but they make contracts. Oh, okay. It's part of radical consent. When you're dealing with BDSM relationships, that stuff's often on paper and binding in some form or another that can cause neither player to not play the role provided. And that's part of why people are into the scene stuff. I don't know how to explain it very, very well. That's it's not exactly my, my motivation. So I am always kind of confused by it, but it's a very common thing. I get radical consent. It's just the whole specifics of the contract being an exciting thing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, that's part of the play for some people. Interesting. And I get that it's important, but the play part I don't understand. <laughs> like, psychologically, it doesn't... I'm not excited about signing a contract with most people, I guess, even if I did someone I wants me to tie them up and I want to tie them up. I yeah, guess that's, that's my point. <laughs> That is understandable. Well, okay. I think that just about wraps it up. Do you have uh, anything else of note, Lee? Absolutely. Um, check out her book. I've actually heard of Gypsy Moon. <laughs> I don't know how, but I do about one of her novels beforehand. Uh, she's a pretty prolific writer and has written like, oh, I'd say 50, 60 books at least. <laughs> they and seem to be very seems long. to be doing very well in this market. I had not heard of her until I stumbled upon it randomly with Alien, BBW, Warrior, BDSM, Romance, Sci-Fi, all those right. taglines. Hashtag. I, I, I have friends that find cryptid romance interesting and have throughout time, so I'm kind of semi-aware of the burgeoning market because of them. <laughs> Very good. Well, I think that just about wraps up our show for the day. Um, you can like, subscribe, all that nonsense. Find us on our socials and uh, see us next time. We'll be doing this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Peace. Have a good night.